Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm the new president. Warwick has stepped back to be uh, the vice president. So you have to put up with me from now on running the show. So welcome to members, both physical and metaphysical. Okay, so um, I'm a bit of a retread. I've done this job before, years ago, before it was incorporated and was made all official, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm much happier in, in non-official type situations, but I'll do my best. Uh, we need to thank Warwick for running the show since 2017. Thank you. Uh, all of the other uh, members of the committee have remained the same. Presidents uh, and vice presidents are the only change. Some of you might remember, we put out a, an email suggesting that we could go up to QAM on the 14th of March. I've had so many replies that I've lost them all. <laughs> Nobody was interested. So the 14th of March QAM, you can consider it cancelled. Bother with it, we've all been. There is another QAM thing. Welcome, come in, sit down. No worries. Uh, there is a second QAM thing, which I do recommend we go to. Uh, it's on the 20th of April. They call it QAM Warbirds, and it's a feed into Anzac Day. And we have been invited to go up uh, with our little stand and promote ourselves as we do elsewhere. So some of the committee members will be coming to do that, including me. I guess I've got no option now, have I? <laughs> and the other interesting thing that we are going to advertise, we need more details yet, uh, Kabulcha, the Beauf Beaufort restoration is going to have an open day on the 18th of May. Uh, hopefully Greg Batts' boomerang will be there as well. Uh, and I believe they are going to put on food. That would be a payment situation. I think they've got, they've got a, a, a one of those people to come and do that job. So we will give you more details on that when we know what those details are. I'll introduce you now to oh. Daryl Holden, who is going to give us a little talk tonight. In fact, I believe it's not such a little talk. He's got lots of pictures, I'm told. So if I can figure out, yes, here we go. I'll transfer you over. Daryl is an ex helo pilot with the RAF. Okay. Daryl Holden, ex Air Force pilot. Uh, I, uh, I joined the Air Force when I was 18, graduated when I was 20, went to Vietnam, basically, because that was on at the time, flying helicopters, came back, flew Neptunes for a while, and then uh, went back flying helicopters. And then the army got the helicopters and then the air force gave me a don't come monday shit but they got me back again when they decided when i worked in director of air force safety for 10 years uh which was quite interesting and then i left the air force after about 40 years okay i got a lot of slides here because i give this also to a bunch of people who know nothing about aviation clubs and nothing about war. So for the, <laughs> that's war, isn't it? Death, destruction, suffering, sadness. Okay, the saga. So this is a story of one night in World War II. And I'll talk about courage here. Churchill said it. It's the quality that guarantees all others. So on the four granite pillars at Usurava, courage, sacrifice, mateship, endurance. Different battle, same war. Different Aussies, same qualities. That's what we're going to talk about the Aussies. Okay, most Australians don't know. 10,000 plus air crew served in Bomber Command. 40% were killed, 4,000 of them. Most are buried where they died. There are no air battle sites, as you know. And a third of them have no known graves, so the families could never grieve. But their, their names are on the running mead, RAF Memorial, and of course they're down in Canberra, Matt. So I just want to clarify all that. 
Oh, before I go on, I'd like to say we've got on a guest here tonight. I know a few here. And my son in law is here, married to my only daughter. He's an ex black or pilot in the army. So he knows all about this. Leadership. You may be given the power to lead, you may have the ability to lead, but only character and courage give you the right to lead. I don't know who said it. So the decisive factor in morale, and morale is one of my big things, was leadership. CEOs, so you'll see that later on. So leadership, morale. That's me graduating, and the guy handing me wings was Air Chief Marshal Wallace Cole. Australian born in Kalgoorlie. He was the last chief of Bomber Command. In fact, at that time, it was in the Strike Command. And he'd been a bomber pilot in World War II. Tough little bloke he was. Flew out in his own V-bomber. We were all tempted to ask him, you got a nuke on board, sir? But no one was game. So he presented the wings to our pilots course, 1968, at Pierce. Thought I'd throw that in. Okay, Operation Chastise, that's the name. In peacetime, they call exercise. In wartime, they call operations in the, the op. So the 45th month of the war, 617 Squadron attacked the dams in the Ruhr Valley, the legendary bomber op. As you can see, the Mona Dam split. After that, I think Churchill called his CEO the Dam Buster. And so they became known as the Dam Busters. They didn't like Après Moi Les Deluge until. The base commander went back to the heraldry and said, but the king liked it. So it just came back straight away. The king approved it, which he had to. He, he, they came and visited him after the op. Okay, 19 Lancasters departed Scampton on the 16th of May to attack those dams. They flew it at night at extreme low level, treetop high, power lines. They thought it was a suicide mission. Some of the crew thought they weren't going to survive the training. 133 aircrew, which 13 Australian, I'll deal with them. Out of the 19 pilots, four were Aussies. The leader, Guy Gibson. He'd been at war for four years and he was 24. He had his flaws, but in eight weeks he trained it for this extreme mission. He was an authentic hero. He was the most decorated pilot in, in the RAF at that stage. He had DSOs and DFCs and bars to them. The bomber, the Avro Lancaster. Oh, I meant to ask. Hands up those who haven't seen the movie. <laughs> so you're all bloody experts, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe you'll get some glean. One pilot, well, they had to economize on aircrew. So they cut out to two pilots that had flown in the older bombers. An ad, flight engine, yeah, bomb aimer. The pilots loved the length when they got it, but they had this real flaw. Only one in seven ever survived the bailout. And I've got a mate who's got a book. There were 9,999 guys who bailed out of these things who were POWs. There's a book on the list of them all. So 10,000 guys got out. So you imagine how many didn't. Okay, for all those who haven't seen the side out, that was what I think was like. That one isn't modified. As you'll see, they've got no upper, uh, mid upper gunner. The bomb bays were pulled out and there was just the one bomb you've seen in it, bomb mine, whatever you want to call it. You can see where the crew were up the front, the bomb aimer. Took out the mid upper gunner, put him in to man it. Okay, here's the crew. That's Guy Gibson. He was the captain skipper. He had to be physically strong to fly a length and crew was there, all seven of them. They were the most important people in the universe. If the tail gunner didn't see you something, you were dead. If the front gunner didn't see you, if the nav couldn't navigate, you never got back. The interesting thing is that Gibson only flew the one mission. The crew, the next big op, all the crew were there, died with the CO. Okay, he's the genius, Barnes Wallace. He pushed that. You can read about the books there. It was a hell of a push, but he eventually got through with all the other scientists. He was a genius. And uh, after years of playing, he, he got it going. And I think was, they were still being delivered around about the time, the day before the operation. Gampton, over to Germany, across the Netherlands mainly. You see over and back. The dams are in the Ruhr. The idea was to flood 
the engine room of Germany, the Ruhr Valley. They're the pilots. So I've gone through it. There were there were three waves. This was a this were the hot shots, read by the CEO. They went out in three lots of threes. These are, the Sorpa was the next one. It was a Earth Dan. And the reserve was there, and they were inexperienced. No matter what you read, they were inexperienced. And there's Canadian, one Yank who was in the can, one Kiwi guy, Les Munro, and the rest were Canadians or Brits. The blue ones, as you saw, I'll run through them one. Okay, 13 Aussie dam busters. Bart and Shannon, the guys who were in red didn't make through the war, and the guys in blue were POWs. So there were pilots, bomb out, the whole lot, except we hardly send any engineers over there. We were colonials and we weren't smart enough. So basically every flight engineer was a POM. So this is their photos. Martin, hey, Lego, Virginia, Knight, Kelly, Barlow. I got all the individual photos and put them there so you could see what they look like. I got Spafford in with, Spafford was in, Gibson's crew. I haven't got an individual photo on it. The top row was the, the I'll show them later, the best crew in Bonnet Command, I reckon. Martin was the leader. He had uh, four other others with him. Okay, this, this is where the words come into it. So Martin was sent to England for medical training, but he, he got mixed up with women, parties and gambling. He blew all his money. War broke out, so he joined the Royal Air Force. <laughs> He was a wild man. Gibson wanted him because he, you can read all about him, but he was a gifted low-level pilot. He was said he was as mad on the ground, mad as a grasshopper, and he called his length Popsy, as he would. The RAF did not regard him as commander material. Dave Shannon, he's my favourite. He was, his old man was an MP, joined, qualified as a pilot, went to 106, got a DFC, he was really good at low flying and Gibson wanted him. He was the youngest pilot in 617 at 20. He was an experienced bomber pilot at 20. He looked like a kid and he grew a mustache to make himself look old. Barlow, he was educated at Melbourne Grammar, had a civilian pilot's license, he was a bit older. He completed the tour, he loved being in bomber command and he'd been awarded a distinguished flying cross the day before chastised. And here's Les Knight, quietly spoken. He, he was 20, he did not smoke or drink, go out much, couldn't ride a bike or drive a car, but he was a brilliant Lancaster the pilot. The crew loved him, but, uh, even though he was a pilot officer, you know, he was in the first wave, he was well respected people. He, he was a, a boy who went to Sunday school. Okay, flying the op. For all you pilots who want to be pilots, consider one pilot to manually fly a length, 30 tonnes, four engines, no power control, five tonnes of fuel, through anti-aircraft artillery for six hours at treetop height at night. Oh, when you get there, coordinate with the crew to drop a five-tonne bomb flying low level at 19 metres or 60 feet over water, being blasted by anti-aircraft cannons. Think of a good job? Suicide mission. Okay, I won't go through all this, but this is a timeline. The first person to take off was Barlow, Norm Barlow. The, the sulfur wave took off before the main Mona wave by about 10 minutes. By 11 o'clock, fires had been shot down and everyone killed. Munro had been hit by flak and had to return back. Rice hit the ocean approaching the Dutch coast. Ripped off his upkeep, filled him up, nearly drowned the tow road. He staggered back and crash landed and nearly ran into Munro in the circuit because they were all on, on uh, radio silence. Barlow crashed into electricity piling and they were all killed. So the reserve wave took off and didn't know already two of their guys had been, two of the crews had been wiped out and two had already turned back. So the first lot, Gibson Martin, arrived at the Mona. Carthy went to the Sorper. Asheville hit power cables, a whole lot were killed. The other guys arrived at the Mona, Gibson attack. Hopgood was second in. He was a hotshot pilot. He was shot down, five killed. Bircher, his, PO, his, his rear gunner, survived, and Fraser did too. They somehow or other got out. 
Martin attacked, Young attacked, nothing happened. Different attacks. And then uh, Maltby was the fourth in, fifth in, and he hit the damn wall, it's gone. So they breached the Mona, Gibson took Shanna Moorsley over, Shanna attacked the Eater, nothing. Moorsley attacked it. I think Shanna had about nine goes lining up on it because it was so steep and they had to level out at 60 feet at night and then line up. <laughs> I don't know how they did it. Knight attacked and he breached it after about three or four goes. Had to pull up and barely stalled over the top of it. Burpee was told to go somewhere. Well, he crashed no one knew about it. He, he hit, they reckon the searchlight got him going over, a, over an airfield where there were night fighters. Otley was ordered to attack and three minutes later he was shot down. Fred T survived somehow or other. He was burnt and uh, they got him out. So that's what you like. If you look at that, well, I said before, there were no photographs because it was all at night and it was secret. No one could talk about it. You couldn't do anything. So this has got to be Gibson. You can already see the burning over the top where Hopgood was shot down and his bomb went over and destroyed the electricity power station. You can see him trying to line up the, the lights. They don't seem to be spot on as they were supposed to be. So Gibson flew alongside to attract the cannons. Uh, I guess that's why he got a VC. Okay, they got there. On the way back, Morsley got killed on the Dutch coast and Young got shot down on the Gulf. Everyone got killed there too. Uh, everyone landed eventually. Bill Townsend, the, he was a sergeant. So he, wasn't, he was the last one home and it was getting light. And the night fighters and all the fighters were up to get him. And somehow or other, he got back through the whole of Germany without <laughs> getting killed. Unbelievable. Okay, post op. There's always a post op. Eight lengths destroyed, 53 air crew, air crew killed, three POWs. Unbelievable. It was an amazing feat of courage, an impossible mission. But luck was important and skill in determining who died and who survived. People, if, you, if you listen to a lot, good luck charms. They were amazing. Uh, Martin, if you've seen the movie, he always carried a toy koala. <laughs> Worked for him. Okay, I'm going to now talk about what happened afterwards to these guys, because that's what it's about, the air crew. So, Vic, so Gibson got the Victoria Cross. He never flew another op with him. He was a man of unshakable courage. He... He'd flown 173 ops on night fighters and bombers. Most people didn't get anywhere near. But in 1944, he con uh, Bomber Harris grounded him and said, you know, he was one of these superheroes that you didn't want to get killed. Anyway, he conned him his way up. He was flying a mosquito, had about eight hours on it, went out, master bomber, and he didn't get back. You can read all about why they think he didn't get back, but he's buried. he took his navigator, who was hardly even qualified, who was the base navigator. Uh, he was a superstar hero, but he shouldn't have gone that night. So I've never all the pilots got logbooks. My logbook look exactly like that, <laughs> like the old Royal Air Force ones. We just got, <laughs> when he got back, awarded the VC. I've never seen that in a logbook. <laughs> Still, I guess if you've got a Victoria Cross, you can put it in your logbook. And for people who don't know, that's what all these medals were. Victoria Crosses, two distinguished service orders, two flying crosses. He was a superstar hero. Okay, this is the Aussies now. Spam Spafford. He was a bomb aimer. Got a DFM, survived a tour. And that's what Bomber Harris wanted in 6.7, experienced air crew. So he was in Gibson's crew. And he got a DFC for chastise. Unfortunately, when Gibson was carted off to America, the new CO, whose name was George Holden, took over and uh, they attacked the Dortmund's Ends Canal. And five of the eight Lancasters were shot down. George, they're flying over this one little town in Germany. Toby, uh, one of the Rear gunners and Martin's crew opened up on the gun, but they had five shots came off, hit the fuel tank, blew up, and the, the CO and the whole crew disintegrated. So he, 
You can see how well we got. He has a DFC and a DFN because he got commissioned. Shanna, he's the boy. Uh, he he was awarded the DSO because he did hit the the eater after ten goes, but it didn't break it. He said it was a bugger of a job. He stayed in six one seven, but after sixty nine ops, he survived. And considering a tour was thirty, he survived all the, the worst part of the war. Cheshire, his later CO, said he he deserved the Victoria Cross. But he is the most decorated out of both aircrafts in World War Two. He's been in the War Memorial. Now he he hasn't got a BC, but I don't rate individual medals according to points. Anyway, this is for the people who 90% of women at the next lot I'm giving, so they like to know thing. He asked the wappy Ann Fowler to marry him the day after, and she said, Yeah, as long as you shave off your stupid mustache. <laughs> so after he did his flying in World War II, he never flew again as a pilot. He, uh, he worked for Shell all around the world. One of the few surviving damn buster pilots, he, he lived with the rest of his life and was lauded and put up. But he was an extremely intense young man. I understand how. Never suffered fools, but they said he was good with children and animals. But he wasn't good with a lot of people. So he's buried in Oxfordshire. He did say later on when they were attacking some big target, when Cheshire was his mad CO, they're walking out and they said, look at the sunset, Dave, said Cheshire. And Shannon said, stop the sunset. I just want to see tomorrow. <laughs> or words for that. Okay, Les Knight. He was a guy, couldn't, good church going boy, couldn't ride, couldn't drive, couldn't do anything. But he, he breached the, the eater. And that's his crew. And you can know they're all afterwards because he's wearing a DSO. Now, DSOs were given to commanders. DSOs were given to pole officers if they weren't prepared to give them a VC. And they weren't prepared to only give one VC. So that's his crew. And I'll talk about him next time. How we're in for nuts. So he's a forgotten hero in my view. And they attacked the Dortmund's End Canal four months later. He hit trees at night, tacking in fog, and he stayed at the controls and he allowed the crew to bail out. As Bob Kello, his WAP, said, uh, he gave his lives for us. So I saw just on the 80th anniversary a few months ago, the people in Denham still put out things. One of the Lank, the Battle of Britain flight, Lank flew over there and they still, they, yeah, they mind his grave and, and uh, look after him. So Bob Kello, he was the wireless operator. He crewed with Les, got a DFM. He went with Jas Dyers and breached the Eater. He was again on the Dortmund's Ems Canal raid. And he stayed at the controls. Les did while they bailed out. Bob, uh, they baited the Gestapo for three months and he got back to England. And when you, if, I don't know if you know, but once you got back and evaded, you were never allowed to fly over Germany again, didn't we? Because if you were captured and tortured again, you'd give away the whole escape route. So, so uh, you know, he, he, they had nothing but admiration for the <coughs> Dutch, French people who saved them. So yeah, it took him three months. Uh, and he came back to Australia, served with 37 Squadron. For, he married a Canadian, which he met in training, and uh, he died uh, he's buried in Winnipeg. Bircher, he was a larrikin, air gunner. Gibson used to ban him from the mess. He'd get booze up and fight the officers. So, and Gibson put this on up. Sergeant Bircher is not allowed to be served in the mess. So they give him drinks out the window. Anyway, he was Hopgood's rear gunner. So as Hopgood was coming in, they were shot up. His engine was on fire. And as he went around, he called a bandit. And as Bircher helped one bloke, he kicked him out, who was in good nick. And they opened his chute inside. But as he went out, he slammed into the tail and broke his back. But he survived. He was captured. And uh, the Germans were short on plaster Paris. So they set his body in building cement. Gestapo came around to 
interrogating court and they kept belting him, but all they could hit was the cement he said. <laughs> so he went to Stalag Law 3 over at the over at Sagan. He survived the war, had a mixed career. He joined the RAF, he went back to England and served in Korea. He died in Tassie in poor health. It's a good story. Okay, that was the best crew in Bomber Command, I reckon. Mick Martin. That's his Aussies. I'll deal with them now. Martin. So this is a guy who was not good with command material because he was a wild man. So he he was knighted, retired as an air marshal. <laughs> he was the greatest pilot in the RAF. And uh, he, uh, he was one of the legends, if you read about him. They took him, they took him off flights. He just kept surviving. The Germans couldn't kill him. He, but he was injured by a bus late in life and died in his sleep in 88. You wouldn't believe it. As his navigator, Jack Lego, Sir Jack Lego, he joined, he joined Mick Martin's crew, went with him to 617. He became 617 nav officer, Gibson Maney. He was awarded his second DFC. After chastise, he, he left 617, did pilot training in Canada and came back and flew Sunderlands for the rest of the war. He returned to Australia. Married Mary Best. He had a distinguished business career in the sugar industry. He was knighted in 1982 to work with Rotary, Red Cross, and Endeavour. Died here in Brisbane. I was giving a talk there last year and someone worked for him. Knew him. He said he was an ultra gentleman. So he had a couple of DFCs. Not a Queenslander, but they accept him. Bob Hay, he joined up. He was Mick Martin's bomb aimer. And he, was, he was the old man, 30, and he was regarded as the father of 617 Squadron and the leading up to it. He got a DFC, well, you would. But later in 44, that was the anti abiaduct attack. And it, Mick Martin's flying through intense anti aircraft fire, as Martin did all the time. A, a cannon shell exploded and killed Bob. <laughs> Martin staggered this thing down. They couldn't get back to England, so he got his, took it down to Corsica. No Sardinia, wasn't it? Yeah. And they buried Bob there. That's where he is today. Tammy Simpson. He was uh, doing law down in Tassie. Anyway, he trained as a WAP air gunner, crewed with Mick Martin as his rear gunner. And uh, he, he, they went training and then he rejoined 617. So he got a DFM. He was taken off ops with Martin and Foxley after the anti fireduct op. And uh, he returned to Tassie, married. Study law, <laughs> practice as a barrister, devote his efforts to legacy, caring for widows, and died in Hobart, age 80, DFC. Toby Foxley from Brisbane, trained as a WAPAG, flew 50 ops as Mick Martin's gunner. He left at the same time when they were all grounded, returned to Oz, posted to New Guinea, later went back to England, got into air traffic control. Now, after doing a few things mucking around, I've cut this down. They moved to Brisbane, back to Brisbane, where he operated the mobile garage at the Gabba and Capalaba. Most people didn't know that. I, one of the guys in the men's shed I go to knew the family. He knew him. He used to pull into the garage when he was a kid. So then he separated from his wife, went to Chinchilla and ran a hotel, motel out there. He went back to England and he died there in 85. He was a good gunner, Larry. Norm Bailey, I don't know much about him. But when you're killed on the, you know, he was the first guy killed when they shot down or hit something. Yeah, he ran into the 100,000 volt power cable near Haldun. The the locals hold up that thing when when the, they fly over for big anniversaries. So he, he wanted to do a second tour for personal reasons. So he went to 617. He's buried in the Reichsfeld War Cemetery. Charlie Williams, he uh, was a while up, while it's up, joined, he was in Barlow's crew, crew, so he was killed with him. He was engaged to Bobby Parfit, the secretary. He, uh, as I said, he got a DFC the day before he went on the mission. He was gonna get married the next week, so he's buried in Reichsfeld. So his story is digitized. He was a sheep farmer from out of Townsville. Stories digitized, and and there's a, an article there 
in the paper the other day about the Courier Mail. I've got a copy of it there. And last but not least, Lance Howard. He he was older. He was in uh, Townsend's crew, the last one back. They attacked the enemy, or they did, not too sure which land they attacked. They'll last the land. After chastised, he was tour expired, promoted. So he returned to Australia, left, founded the Air Force Memorial State of Bull Creek, and he lived there happily with his wife till he died. And there is an excellent aviation museum, and they've got a Lancaster in there. So his brother, that's a photo of him. His brother was killed earlier in the Air Force, somewhere down in Italy. So he survived, his brother died. Cheshire was the CO after Martin was the TCO for a while. And he was the true blue hero, you know, VC. And he said exactly that. 617 would not have been the unit. It was without its Australian contingent. Like it would never be seen. 54 aircrew dead, three POW, eight lengths dead, two dams wrecked, and brilliant flying. Lord Tedder, who was who was the deputy head of shape and Eisenhower, said, was it worthwhile? And there's been a lot of criticism. I like John Sweetman, a forensic book there. He said, for every military operation, the moral effect far exceeds the physical damage. There's also hope that success will boost national morale. Just like the war was really bad in 43. I mean, really bad. And the British people need hope and a lift in morale. And that's what 617 Scott and gave them. The evidence shows that Dan Buster rain, but there are still people who say it was. And here's some outcome with hindsight. The one thing about it was the Royal Air Force prestige was handed in America. And the Americans in, in America, the Royal Air Force had a higher uh, recognition factor than the whole of Britain. The, Brit the Americans didn't like the Royal Navy or the British Army, but they held the Royal Air Force in high esteem. And that made a difference with the help. They were sending across. 1,400 people died. A lot of them were Germans, but there were a lot of slaves who were locked in and they, they locked them in their barracks overnight. So when the flood came down, they drowned. Max Hastings, whose books there, who's chastised, brilliant author, he doesn't think it was worth it. So was the, was the glory of it outweigh the horror of it? The movie had many omissions and quite a lot of errors. But that's how a lot of people get their history. And they're the ones I read. Brick Hill, Brick Hill wrote the first book on it. He, he, he wrote that, uh, that uh, you know, and that's where the movie came from. If you look, look at the Burgess is written there, Hastings, Sweetman. I've got a good book there. And so, I mean, you could talk about this for hours, all this intricacies and who said what and how many guns there were. And, mm. But I tried to concentrate on all the 13 guys who people don't know anything about. So they know about the hero pilots, but they don't know about the, the gunners and what happened to them and how many of them died and crews, everything. The pilots will tell you without the gunners, they would have died plenty of times, especially in the main Lancaster Ops. The navigators, hell. When they first, Bomber Command first went over Germany, they couldn't even find Germany in the early days, let alone a city. That's why they bombed cities, because they couldn't find it. So what, the navigators were critical to even getting back. So no one gives them credit. But Jack Lego, what have got here? He comes back here, gets knighted, runs a ship. Uh, so two of them were around here, around Brisbane. People don't really know that. Didn't it? Huh? People, if you'd have refueled down at the Gabba or Cabal Bay, you would have come across Foxley. Oh, that was in the 50s and six. No, in 62, he came back. It was in your time. Jack Lego was here running the sugar industry. Right. And now, questions, seeing you're all experts on Bomber Command or, or this. Thing. Uh, I probably haven't told you anything you don't know, but I think a, a lot of the individual stuff people don't know about, you know, farmers. Guys from their bank tellers joined up. And, uh, you know, for every one pilot, there were six other guys down the back. And they died as well. Did any of the, um, any of the, 
the pilots actually write any um um not stories but write any i can't uh, find anything from martin uh shannon was an angry bugger and he stayed angry all his life but he denounced a lot of people the only one who wrote a book was uh, gibson he was grounded and told to write a book it's called enemy coast ahead i've never read it they reckon it's pretty good uh i've just read the critics of it so yeah, well, hardly any of the pilots survive. If you, if you go back and find that uh, by the end of the war, out of the 19 pilots, there weren't many of them alive. Well, can you, if, if we went back and saw some of the, the uh, paintings, you're at 60 feet straight and level, and you've got two 20 millimeter cannons pointing at you. How do you survive? Just luck. So Hopgood didn't, but, but can you add, I, I, and Adrian knows he, his son, Dave, is an army pilot too. Flying around in a four engine bloody aircraft at treetop height at night and then trying to hit a dam at 60 feet and 19 meters. I mean, I couldn't have done it. Maybe, uh, you know, they sort of did it, but they, they must have been brilliant pilots. That's all I can say. Just how hard it was. Uh, I, think, uh, I think Clive Rowley wrote this fantastic book for the 70th anniversary. He was a, he was a fighter pilot in the, Air, in the Royal Air Force. And he, it's quite a good book. It's all the colour photographs and fantastic thing. And he, he said, you know, uh, the, bomber fly, the bomber flyers needed steady, calm, understated courage, sustained for long periods, night after night. Fighter pilots just need to be aggressive. Uh, many were... Fearful, but sheer courage overcame their fear. And so they act as though they weren't. But if you read some of the testimonies, one, one of the navs said, God, I never thought we'd survive the training, let alone the mission. So, uh, and uh, so all military actions made up, as he said, the three M's mistakes, myths, and miracles. So you've got to get. You've got to get rid of the myths out of uh, the dam busters. Why is it so important? The Americans, B-17 doesn't because they never had the dam buster raid. The dam busters is well renowned because of, and the Lank is now because of this one mission. And, uh, never happened again. Never did anything like it again. And as, as he said, I always feel humble and inspired after presenting on such self-sacrifice and courage. And you don't realise those blokes went out Hopgood's navigator, they got, he died. He said, he quoted, he said, I'm not coming back tonight. And he quoted that eight out of the 19 wouldn't come back. And he was dead right. He died, but he, he predicted to one of the other crews as he went out. So they knew they were for it. Uh, so incredible story. People aren't like that anymore. And uh, it's all about the aviators, not necessarily the, the plane. I'll make, it, make a comment rather than a question. Um, I worked with a guy who was in Bomber Command um, and he jumped out of a, I think it was a Lancaster. And it was interesting, you're, you mentioned earlier the success rate of bailouts. One, One in seven survive. Well, he jumped out of a, a, I think it was a Lancaster, didn't have a parachute. He survived. I worked with him. Yes. Joe Herman was his name. Yeah. So how did he do that? He grabbed. He grabbed his one of his um, one of the other crew members. He grabbed his legs on. He, he bumped into him and yeah. grabbed his legs on the way down, yeah. and and he was trying to kick him off. By the way, so Joe told me. Uh, but they both survived. Um, well, that comes under the miracle side. Yeah, yeah that's right. And you mentioned over 4,000 died in Bomber Command. 1,014 of those were in 460 Squadron, yeah. I don't believe, the one that my father-in-law was in. Yeah, so, 460 Squadron had the highest loss rate yeah. in Bomber Command. Yep. But it was a bigger squadron. They say flew more missions. But you're right. Uh, th now, there is a sequel to this. There's 617 Squadron after this. 
This was the first mission. Now they flew right till the end of the war and they were trained and, and Bomber Harris, the indomitable controversial Bomber Harris decided to keep 617 Squadron going because the Navy and the Army wanted simple targets attacked. So he said, I'll put all the old lags as he called them, the guys who wanted to keep flying and put them in 617 and make them an elite squadron. So then they went to, to Barnes Wallace and said, hey, you were talking about these big bombs. So then they built the six ton bomb, which was called uh, yeah, tall. tall Boy. Then they went to the Grand Slam, that was a 10. They dropped 41 of those and they took out submarine pens, viaducts, and they were the Sam Tunnel. Tunnel, yeah. It stopped stopped uh, stopped uh, some Nazi uh, divisions coming up on D Day. So, so the six one seven went on, and uh, I think one of the, I think uh, not the in Brickhill's book, he asked an air commodore in the Royal Air Force when he wrote the book in fifty one. He said, "What was six one seven worth?" And he said, "Oh, probably ten times any other squadron." Daryl, one of the things that I've not realised before is the number of times they went around again and again because they were committed to one track in, one particular altitude above the water with all of the defences mm -hmm. um, ready for them. So that, it, that is incredible courage. It's, yeah. Uh, they, they just couldn't get down sometimes when they went to the Eater. Luckily, the Eater wasn't, didn't have anti-aircraft guns, but they had to dive down and get down and get up. In fact, uh, Les Knight nearly crashed into the ridge line on the other side. But they, they think, I think uh, Shannon had 10 goes at the Eater. And it, after seven, Gibson said, look, give it a break. I'll send down Maudsley. Then Maudsley went down. He had trouble. But his his upkeep went over the top. And it, it, they reckon it blew him up. Anyway, he got shot down. No one ever knew what happened to him. Then Knight came in. The bloke who couldn't drive or anything. He got down, did a couple of rows, slammed it and blew it up. Uh, Shannon did go before him. After 10 goes, he got him. But... Uh, Martin, they, you, do, you do know that Martin went out, this is one of the anecdotes, they were out there on the afternoon and the, they just loaded the upkeeps on and they were all standing around the cockpit with the wacky and then someone touched something and the upkeep fell down. Everyone just ran and ran away. People were running. In fact, the air crew were passed by the ground crew, they reckon, as they were running away. And the, and the, Anyway, they went back and they got the engineering officer and the engineering officer came out and said, well, if it hasn't, he walked over and he said, well, if it hasn't gone off yet, it's not going off. So he went in and just decommissioned it. But they think that might have damaged it. So when he dropped his upkeep, it went slightly off. So it could have it said, hit the ground. So they had to jack it back up. And put it. There's a million stories. In there. But, but you're right. But even though they'd trained on British dams, when they got there at night, and they found that there's two 20 millimeter cannons on the Mona. And Gibson came in, they weren't too sure first up when Opkit came in, they were right on him. So Gibson flew in beside him. And then on the, he got shot down. And then the next guy, get his name young, I think it was, came in. And Martin and Gibson flew either side of him to distract the gunners. And the gunners were good, like, like Foxley and that. They were, they were taking out those 20 millimeter cannons. So by the time the last guy got in, they virtually neutralised the 20 millimetre cannons. But these were good gunners. Even though they were flying three, firing 303s, uh, you know, they were, didn't have 50 cals or 20 millimetre guns. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a hell of a story. But the courage of those people is amazing. Yes. Brown, Sorry, Brown had said when he returned, that when he was, when he was uh, attacking the Sorpy, he had to do a stall turn. Mm. Now you think a stall turn at mm. night in a Lancaster. Wow. Beyond my school level. Yes, yes. So uh, McCarthy, the American, he attacked the Sorpy. He got off late. He did 
ten, his, his bomb owner wouldn't let him drop for 10 goes. He went around 10 times before he let him drop. Uh, but the, the upkeep couldn't knock over that earthenware dam anyway. So only the, only the uh, cement dams they got. So, uh, yeah, Gav? This, half, this afternoon I watched the uh, uh, memorial, the 70th yeah. anniversary yeah, of I had a look at that too. Dam Busters. And and it made mention there, and and I think that video was ten years hence. So the reason for the question is, they said in that video that six one seven was now based in Lossiemouth. Mm. Is that still where it is? I think so. I, I was in. Lossiemouth. I don't know what they're flying these days. I must admit, I haven't kept up with it. Yeah, I was in Lossiemouth at yeah. RAF Lossiemouth just a oh. couple of months ago, yeah. and. Um, Oh, well, my family comes from around there, oh. and I was just—I I oh, did go on to the base, but yeah. I was interested to hear that. Uh, yeah, well, well, uh, that's where they were flying yeah. out of. Uh, I when think they Scampton's. Really they had tornadoes or something. I think Scampton's now closed. That's it's interesting, uh, and I say without comment. I think Scampton was going to be used to house uh, to. Uh, Scampton was going to be used to house the illegal migrants coming across the channel. Mm, so that's yeah. what happens to a great Air Force state. Well, the other thing you've got to remember about Scampton when they took off that night was a grass airstrip. A grass airstrip. Um, that's during the war. Yeah. Would you imagine taking off? It was grass when I learned to fly here. But you're not taking off with a five ton yeah. bomb strapped on yeah. you. <laughs> I was in the Victoria tour. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they moved after that when they started getting the really big bombs. When they started putting on the tall boys and the grand slams, they had to go to a cement airstrip. What did upkeep weigh? Five tons. Five tons. Mm. Uh, Richard, on uh, the internet, you have a question. Go ahead. Thanks. I do, um, Daryl. I didn't quite understand what you meant about a third of the way through your talk. A, a, a Lancaster was shot down and one of the crew was set in cement, you said, or words to that effect. It, 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 what did you mean by that? Well, well, when Hopgood was shot down, when his bomb went over the top of the Mona, he, he was already shot before that. His engine was on fire, so he, he turned away. He called abandon, and and Tony Bircher, the rear gunner, grabbed a guy who'd already lost a leg, kicked him out, and he bailed out by letting his parachute out, but he hit the tailplane on the way out and broke his back. So he, he evaded for three days until some uh, Hitler Youth Corps kid found him, and they took him to the hospital, but they didn't know where he came from because it was three days afterwards and there had already been bombing raids. So, so because he had a broken back, the German doctors, they, the Germans didn't, had run out of plaster of Paris, so they sent him in real cement. They, just, they, they put his broken back and set it in real cement. Thank you, thank you. And when the Gascarpo came around to beat him up a bit, they kept whacking the cement and he thought it was a bit of a joke. So, yeah, that's a bit of a light side of it. Another guy got out of it, uh, one of the guys up the front, he he bailed out and he was fine, but they all ended up in Stalag Look 3. So, again, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point, that. And one other guy was a POW, one of the ones that crashed, Barlow's. No, it wasn't Barlow. One of the other guys crashed and the uh, rear gunner was thrown out and he, he was burnt. But he survived. All the other six died. So there were three POWs out of that. Any other questions from the Zoomies? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining in. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. I hope you appreciated just... And I hope you learned something. Yeah, learned something and, and, and got some beginnings of understanding of what... Uh, sacrifice, endurance, what, courage. Etc. Yes, courage and sacrifice particularly. Courage. Courage. Uh... Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Dad.